Good morning and welcome to the third meeting in 2018 of the Rural Economy and Connectivity Committee. Could I please ask all people present to make sure their mobile phones on, are on silent? Stuart Stevenson has submitted his apologies for this meeting. The first item on the agenda is a decision on taking business in private. The committee has asked to take, consider taking item four in private. This is where we will consider appointing a reporter to the Environment, Climate Change and Land Reform Committee discussions on the environmental implications of aquaculture. Are all members agreed? agreed. We are agreed. We will then move on to agenda item two, which is major transport infrastructure projects update. I would like to invite any members present to declare any interests if they, ha if they have them relevant to this item. Does anyone have any interests? No, we're not doing railways, so... No, I don't think it's relevant. Okay, so this evidence uh, session is an update from the Cabinet Secretary for the Economy, Jobs and Fair Work on the progress of major transport infrastructure projects which he is responsible for. I'd like to welcome from the Scottish Government Keith Brown, the Cabinet Secretary for Economy, Jobs and Fair Work, Michelle Rennie, the Director of Major Transport Infrastructure Projects, Alistair Graham, the Head of Planning and Design at Transport Scotland, and Roy Brannan, the Chief Executive of Transport Scotland. Before I ask the Cabinet Secretary to make a short opening statement, I'd just like to draw people's attention to the fact there was an error in the papers produced for the committee as far as the completion date of the APWR, which was referred to the winter 2018. Um, it should have referred to the winter 2007. 18. Technically, we will still be in the winter to, of 2018 when we complete the project, but I'm sure the Cabinet Secretary will clarify that, and I'd therefore like to ask him to make a short opening statement, Cabinet Secretary. Yeah, thank you, Convener. I'm not sure I can clarify the committee's remarks, although we did prepare a press release uh, in response to one of the members of the committee's um, assertions about that timescale, and that's not the timescale we're working to, just to confirm that. Uh, thanks very much for the chance to... Uh, provide the opportunity to update the committee on the major transports uh, projects portfolio. It's been a very busy time for the projects and there have been significant works undertaken across all of the projects we're going to discuss in recent months. Uh, first of all, I would bring the committee's attention to the announcement made on Monday of this week, uh, alerting bridge users to the fact that the Queen's Ferry Crossing will become a designated motorway from the 1st of February. And that represents the latest successful milestone in what is a remarkable project. Uh, as members will be aware, the Queen's Ferry Crossing was opened in a phased manner to allow road users uh, and local communities an opportunity to familiarise themselves with the new road layout, whilst at the same time gradually increasing speed limits. Now that road users are familiar with the new environment and corresponding speed limits, we feel that it's appropriate to implement the full managed crossing strategy and to designate the new crossing as a motorway. In effect, this will mean that the changes to the types of vehicles uh, will be made that can use the new bridge with non-motorway traffic no longer allowed access to the Queen's Ferry crossing. I, I came acro across the crossing this morning and of course the existing fourth road bridge was closed to high-sided vehicles, uh, double-deckers double -deckers in particular, uh, and that was the buses which use that as a public transport corridor, so that's one of the benefits, obviously, of the replacement crossing. Uh, the change also provides a, a monumental opportunity for cross-force travel for all modes of travel. It will include the full opening of the public transport corridor, notwithstanding the wind issues that we're experiencing, uh, for buses, taxis and motorcycles up to 125cc, and allow pedestrians and cyclists to use the dedicated public transport links and the fourth road bridge. In order to assist road users to understand the new road and bridge layouts, an excellent road user guide has been published this week and will be made widely available at the libraries, petrol stations, bus and train stations and tourist information offices along the fourth corridor and across the east central Scotland region. In addition, the guide has also been published online and has been promoted via social media. The 70 mile an hour speed limit was implemented on the Queen's Ferry crossing on the 19th of December. This phased approach introduced final traffic arrangements on the new bridge, allowing traffic to move gradually from 40 to 50 miles an hour and now finally 70 miles an hour. And during this period, we've monitored the new structure to be undertaken uh, safely, whilst allowing road users to become familiar with the network and layout. Since opening, traffic volumes have generally returned to the previous levels seen on the fourth road bridge, and the traffic flows have improved 
as the speed, speed limit has been raised, first of all, to 50 miles an hour, and early indications suggest this is also the case with the increase to 70 miles an hour. An initial journey time assessment has been undertaken for the fourth corridor between the M90 Junction 2 Admiralty and the M9 Junction 1A in both directions. Uh, the free flow journey time for this route since the transition to 70 miles an hour has typically been about 9 to 10 minutes, and that's a, a slight improvement on journey times around 10 to 11 minutes regularly observed prior to the raising of the speed limit. Uh, that may be a small improvement. It's too early to say conclusively that journey times have improved significantly. It's anticipated there'll be further improvements when the managed motorway is brought into full operation towards the end of this month, uh, and Traffic Scotland will continue to monitor traffic levels closely. Just to remind the committee, this is a replacement crossing. It wasn't um, built to increase capacity, although it does have that effect, given the public transport corridor nature of the existing bridge. Uh, moving on to the Aberdeen Western Peripheral Route, Balmeri to Tipperty project. Uh, if I can provide the committee with an update following the announcement on the 15th of January that Carillion has filed for insolvency. Uh, Carillion Construction Limited had a one-third share in the AWPR construction joint venture uh, responsible for delivering the construction phase of the AWPR project. And as members of this committee will be aware, news of this insolvency has created a major impact on, on the construction industry. On the Monday morning after Carolyn had made their announcement, I had a phone call with David Mundell, the Secretary of State for Scotland, to reinforce our commitment to work with the UK Government to best mitigate the impact of that announcement. I then met with high-level government officials across government and agencies to discuss key actions and to consider plans going forward on Tuesday the 16th of January. And following that meeting, helplines were set up for employees and companies who may be affected by the liquidation of Carillion. On the 17th, I had a constructive meeting with representatives from the STUC, Unite and GMB unions and assured them that we were doing all that we can to minimise job losses. So I'd like to provide my assurance to the committee that I will continue to be in close contact with the liquidators and the UK government regarding the measures that they intend to put in place regarding private sector, network rail and UK government backed contracts and to secure the completion of those contracts. I reiterated that the Scottish Government had been working to manage or eliminate risks associated with Carillion's difficulties since July last year, and we have contingency plans in place for all the affected contracts, including, of course, the AWPR. And should it be necessary, we stand ready to support any affected employees through our PACE initiative, which aims to minimise the time individuals are affected by redundancy. We also recognise it's a very worrying time for Carillion workers, and my thoughts are with those affected by the announcement, but we have been working closely with the Aberdeen Roads Limited Consortium to understand the impact of the announcement on those people employed by Carillion. In this regard, I understand that steps have been taken for Carillion personnel who were due to remain on the project to transfer to the remaining joint venture partners for the project. Uh, unlike some other projects that you may have seen reported elsewhere in the UK, where essentially the gates were locked uh, on the announcement, uh, the MPD form of contract used for AWPR caters for a number of different scenarios, including a situation such as this with Carillion. So as a result, I'm pleased to confirm that unlike some of those other projects, work on this project will continue. I can also confirm that the announcement generates no direct additional costs to the Scottish Government, as each partner of Aberdeen Roads Limited and its construction joint venture are joint and several reliable for the performance of the contract. And we've been advised by Aberdeen Roads Limited that the remaining construction partners, Balfour BT and Gallifer Tri, will now take the necessary steps to jointly deliver the remainder of the project. I've previously advised the committee that the project was due to open in the spring, and indeed work is well advanced. In fact, there is a, a road along the 58-kilometre length um, of the project. Um, you can drive it now, and I intend to drive it in the next two or three weeks. Uh, however, whilst the situation with Carillion does not in itself affect project delivery timescales, members will appreciate that given the scale of this issue and the potential for a loss of confidence in the supply chain, we have been contacted by, certainly I've been contacted by one um, party in the supply chain. There is the potential for that loss of confidence. So it's important that we now take the necessary time to work closely with the ARL to identify any impacts that they can identify on delivery. We'll then consider what we can do to mitigate any issues that may arise as a consequence of that. And that might take some weeks to determine. However, I'm happy to provide further updates to the uh, RDC committee in due course. It continues to be a busy period on the 
nine dueling programme. The work is continuing across the route, and road users are already benefiting from the new dual stretch between King Craig and Dalradi, which is open to traffic at the end of September last year. With the construction contract for the second section between Lunkerty and Pass of Burnham expected to be awarded during the first half of this year. And the procurement of an A9 advance works framework is also underway. At the same time, design work on the remaining nine schemes of the dueling programme is well advanced, with over 90% of the dueling programme having reached preferred route status. In total, over the last couple of months, we've published draft orders for four dueling schemes representing around 30 miles of the 80 miles to be dueled. Draft orders were published for the Killycrankie to Glengarry project at the end of November, and those for Pitlochry to Killycrankie, Glengarry to Dalwhinnie, and Dalwhinnie to Crubmore were all published in December. And there'll be no let up in the design work as we expect to publish draft orders for further dueling schemes over the coming months. It's not just a project about uh, building a road, it's part of an ambitious dueling programme uh, where we have developed, for example, the Academy 9 education and training programme with the goal of getting local pupils ready for local jobs as the A9 dueling programme will create. Design work is also well underway on the A96 dueling Inverness to Aberdeen programme. We've published draft orders on the 31 kilometres Inverness to Nairn, uh, Nairn bypass section, and expect to identify later this year the preferred option for the 46 kilometre section between Hardmuir and Fockabers. Route options assessment work is also underway in the 42 kilometre section between East of Huntley and Aberdeen, and we expect to present the options under consideration to the public later this year for feedback with a preferred option to be identified in 2019. Uh, following the opening of the Wraith underpass in February 2017, the M8 bundle project fully opened to traffic on the 1st of June. Significant journey time savings have been experienced across the Central Scotland motorway network with road users enjoying peak journey time savings of 20 minutes on the M8 and 15 minutes at the Wraith interchange, as well as more reliable journey times, enhanced safety and reduced admissions. Finishing works are ongoing and expected to be completed in the coming months. On Presswick, I'm aware the committee is likely to have some questions in relation to Presswick Airport and happy to discuss those in more detail, but I should restate that the Government's wish remains for Presswick to grow into the successful and vibrant business we believe it can be. You may know that the uh, airport's annual report and accounts were published on the 15th of December, and that contains some positive statistics, so passenger numbers rose by 8%. Aircraft movements increased by 8.2%, turnover increased by 11.5 million to 13.6 million, an increase of 18, uh, sorry, from 11.5 million to 13.6 million, which is an increase of around 18%. Operating losses were £7.8 million for the 12 month uh, trading period, compared with £8.7 million for the previous 12 uh, month trading period. We've had increased revenue from military activity. Uh, gross revenue has increased by 33% over three years in that regard. But we've always acknowledged that there is no quick fix and it will require a sustained effort over a number of years. And I'm keeping developments closely under review. So finally, just to thank the committee for the opportunity to update you and happy to try and answer any questions. Thank you, Cabinet Secretary. Before we go into the questions, could I ju just say to the committee, um, you, there were one or two people wondered if they could ask questions on the Queen's Ferry crossing. We had not produced a briefing for that on the basis that we thought that fell within a different minister's portfolio. But if there are committee members with questions on the uh, Queen's Ferry crossing, I'd like to take them at the end. Um, so I, I will introduce those and let anyone ask questions. So those who have questions, please do that at the end. Um, Cabinet Secretary, um, there was, as I think we alluded to, some confusion on the winter of uh, 1718 and uh, the winter of 18, as far as press release. You then slipped the word spring in for opening this year. Was that a slip or could you clarify just for me whether it is winter 2017-18 or spring 2018? I think it means exactly as it was I said last time. We had a discussion, if you recall, about the spring, and uh, May was mentioned and April was mentioned at the time. Uh, I think part of the confusion is because when we announced this project, it was the former First Minister, we said it would be done, we were aiming for the spring of this year. The contract that has tried to finish this during the course of the winter. Um, but as to the final completion date, as I say, we're involved in discussions with them. We're coming towards the very end of the contract, and I'm happy to update the committee in future on that. OK, we'll move to the first question then, which is Peter Chapman. Well, I would just like to explore that just a wee bit more, because there has been confusion about the opening date, and I would, I would like to 
Keith Brown, to just, just give us a, a real definitive answer. I mean, are we saying that it will definitely, this full road will be open by the, and, you know, let's give you the benefit of the doubt and say the end of the spring of, of this year, which would be May of 2018. Can the Cabinet Secretary tell us now that this road will be completed by the, the end of May 2018? So there is no confusion as to where we are with this. Uh, no, I think I have to go back to the statement I made, which is that we have to discuss with the contractor. That's still our intention, and we have uh, no intention of trying to change that date. If we can get it done uh, in that date, then that's what we intend to do. Uh, and what I would say is the discussions that we're having aren't having about winter next year or anything like that. What we're actually discussing are some of the roads being uh, opened earlier than the date that you mentioned, and to see what date we can get for the completion of all uh, parts of the road. Uh, now, it's in our interest to do that, obviously the commitment that we've made to do that, but it's also in the interest of the contractor. They will receive no money and they will be under some pressure from the lenders to make sure they start to receive some income. So they have a big incentive to do that as well. And that's a discussion we're having. And until we've had that discussion and to bottom out any other further consequences there might be from the Carillion fallout for the supply chain, then we're not able to be, uh, give a definitive date. As I say, people, and Mr Chapman will know this from his own local experience, can see the extent of work, the, the road itself that's been done. So you can see uh, the work that's been done there. So we are coming towards the end of this. We can't be definitive until we have that further discussion with the developers about the latest um, situation with Carillion. But as soon as we do have that date, I'm happy to provide it to the committee. Well, I have concerns, I must admit. I mean, I do drive that, that road, not the new road, obviously, because we don't get on the new road, but the, you know, the, 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 the bit from Mintler to, to Stenhaven, I drive twice a week, twice a week, uh, and I see the, the amount of work that's going going, and I also see the amount of work that's still to be done. And I just have severe doubts as to whether we can ever meet that May, even that May target. So I, I'll leave that with you. I mean, mm. I, that's the, the perception as far as I'm concerned. Now, just to, to move on, I mean, the Carillion liquidation is obviously an issue as well, and I, I know you made a statement to the, to the to Parliament a week ago, but things, you know, in, in a situation like this, a week's a long time, as they say, and things have moved on. So, I mean, you, you assured the, the, the Chamber last week that the, the Carillion issue would have no effect on the completion date and no effect on the on the cost. I mean, is that still the situation or, is, or, or has things moved on, have things changed in the, in the week since? I, I think what I was saying last week is the announcement by Carillion uh, in itself has no impact on uh, the costs uh, to us directly because the costs to complete this project still fall on the remaining two partners in the joint venture. And also there's nothing in that announcement from Carillion that in itself should mean there should be a delay to the project because for the same reason I've mentioned, the two continuing contractors are obliged to do that. And there is more I can say if the committee wants to know about it, about the employees of Carillion who are being taken on, some of them, by um, the other contractors. And that's in order to try and see through the project. Uh, so just to reaffirm that the, the, the two remaining contractors have a very acute interest in doing this as quickly as possible. The one area of doubt, and the member's quite right to say this changes over time. So what they're now looking at, they, they've not just told me, they've had to tell the stock market, the two contractors, that they're going to complete this project. But there are issues in the supply chain. So it's a question of some of the payments. Now, the vast bulk of it seems to be pretty secure in that it was the ARL, the consortium, that let the contracts, nearly all of the contracts, apart from, I think, two contracts. But there are two contracts, one for labour and another one, I think, for fleet services, which were let directly by Carillion. And so we're bottoming out that. And also whether there's an issue in terms of the confidence of the supply chain. If some, for example, subcontracts start to worry about payment, and some of that is working its way through. So both in terms of the two remaining contractors and what the official receiver appointed by the UK government is saying to the subcontract chain is of importance. And I think there was a quote we got from uh, the contractors that are currently there about changing, changing the situation's changing daily, I think they said that. So we're just keeping tabs on that. But in its own right, the, the announcement by Carillion uh, means that the two contractors will take over both the costs and the responsibility for delivery of the project. Uh, another question. I'd like to bring Mike in, if yep. I may, and then come back to you, Mike. Sorry. I just wonder how I out this completion date, because we seem to be, all that's happened now and so far in this meeting is that we seem to have thrown confusion in there. As far as I understand it, 
Um, ministers have always said, yourself included, that it will be completed by you're know, aiming for the winter, and the winter finishes in five weeks' time. And Peter Chapman, my colleague, has just mentioned, well, the end of spring, and would that go on to the summer? What I'm trying to get at is, for no other reason, that drivers, commuters, people who live in and around Aberdeen who want to use this route, need to know, for their own planning purposes, when ministers <coughs> think... I mean, I'm not trying to die you down to a date, but when ministers think that this project should be completed and that drivers will be able to use it. Um, if, it if it's drifting towards the summer, then I think we should say so, let people, let people know that. Um, can the minister be a little bit more specific as to when he thinks um, commuters can use this road? Well, I hesitate to, to answer, because I answered the member's question in the chamber, I then put a press release out completely misrepresenting what I'd said. Um, so all I can say is what I've said so far. Um, and in fact, the idea that this hasn't been said before, I, I, the committees, the last time I updated the committee, I think my words were, um, we are talking about spring next year. Um, now, I, I understand the member's point that uh, despite the fact that local people have been campaigning for the road for 50 years, they want to get a definitive time. The contract's been going on actually for a relatively uh, short period of time in terms of the, the size of the contract it was for many months, the biggest roads project in the whole of the UK. And we are talking about that period. We are, that's what we're talking about the, over that period that we mentioned last year. I think we talked about the convener and I, April and May last year. We are talking about that. I just cannot be definitive until we bottom out what other implications there might be that coming from the contractors that might affect that. We're not talking about, uh, and I can only just assure the committee that the idea that this is going to go into the winter of 2018, which actually I think was way back when I gave evidence or appeared before Aberdeen City Council, fairly unusually, they were very concerned that it was done before the spring of 2019 in order to allow the Hodigan um, to, to move forward, which it will do as soon as this project is complete. So it has been brought back in uh, from that time. And as I've said, and as a fer former First Minister said at the start of this, this was after, and Mike Rumbles will remember this, when the, the legal process was set aside and completed. Um, I said at that point we're aiming for spring 2018. Now we're not changing that, I'm not saying to the committee today there's a change to that, but we do have to have that discussion with the developer and we're in that very final stages of the programme where we have to try and boil it down. I understand uh, the members' uh, eagerness to have a definitive date. We have waited 50 years for this and we are trying to get it finished as quickly as we can and as soon as I have a more definitive date, pending discussions between Transport Scotland <coughs> and the contractors, I'm happy to provide that to the committee. I would just like to say that um, I would hate to issue a press release that misrepresented you, because I'm trying to be absolutely straight. I am now confused as to when people, myself included, are able to, to use this road. Could I also therefore, uh, you said in, the, in your opening statement that um, part of the road would, could be opened earlier. Specifically, my question now is focusing on the fast link between Stonehaven and, um, and Charleston. Is that road going to be open? Is that element going to be open earlier than we might expect before we see the whole road open? Could you give me an idea of if that's going to be the case? Yeah, happy to do that. Can I say, first of all, on the, the press statement you issued said I hadn't answered, and I did answer. I said it was the same as I'd said to the committee before. That was the point that I found to be well, uh, misleading. If I say I'm still, I'm still confused as to your answer I, now. I, I, but, just stop. I, I, I don't think it's helpful to look back on the press statement. Let's try and see if we can get an answer to the question now. And there are lots of other questions. So, Cabinet Secretary, yeah. could I push you to try and answer that question rather than look back at the, the press statement, uh, yeah. if I may, please? Well, can I say that, first of all, Crabston and Dice have already opened and opened some time ago. It'd be useful to have the officials. There's a number of roads which may open prior to the completion of all works. And I don't know if Michelle, you want to come in on that? So, um, in terms of the completion date, we're still, we're still working to the same programme that we were always working to. But, it, you know, the announcement about Carillion last week was a blow to the construction industry in the UK, never mind the AWPR project. So, it would be naive to think that there won't be any impact on the AWPR project. As Mr Brown said, from a contractual perspective, there is no automatic right to any additional, uh, additional time. Um, but what we are doing is we are discussing with the contractor what elements of the scheme that he can open as quickly as he can. And we'll then look at 
uh, what, what other impact, if any, that there might be on the, the, the programme for final completion? Mm -hmm. Bring Fulton in there and then go back to Peter, if I may. Yeah, it was just, um, thanks, convener, for bringing me in. It was just, I checked, uh, had a quick Google search uh, while we were talking there, and I found a daily record article for 2012. I wonder if the Cabinet Secretary uh, recognises, and it's talking about the, a quote from Alex Hammond in there that I know he mentioned, and, and the quote is here, work is expected to begin in 2014 and be complete by the spring of 2018. That's a direct quote from the article, and that was the day, or some point in 2012 anyway, October 2012. Do you recognise that article and is that time scales? That you're working to? Well, I certainly reckon, I don't, not the article, but the time no. scales, and there's various other public statements were made exactly consistent with that. I would say and acknowledge that I've previously had to come to the committee and say the Balmeri, tip, Balmeri Tipperty section, uh, due to weather and other circumstances, wasn't completed according to the contractor's programme, and I did give the commitment that would be completed at the same time as the overall project. And there's no question, that I think it was 2015, we had some extraordinary weather at that time, which um, uh, everyone will know about um, as well. So I'm not saying that this is a, a seamless thing, these projects are big projects, but Yes, that was what was stated at the start of the contract, uh, both apparently in the daily record and elsewhere as well. Thank you. Peter. A wee bit more about the Carillion situation. How will the payments due to Carillion up to its liquidation be managed? And in what effect might this have on the other two partners? Uh, well, the two partners have made a public statement, uh, as they see it, about the impact of the Carillion, um, if you like, withdrawal, and they see themselves as having a, a very substantial financial impact. But that is for the partners themselves and the lenders involved in the consortium uh, to manage. Uh, there will be no impact on the contract payment structure in ARL Limited. Uh, they receive payment, as I've mentioned, once the roads become due, and to go back to Mike Rumble's previous question, if a part of the project is opened early, they'll start to receive payment for that part of the project. Uh, the contract with ARL has built-in provisions that uh, both the remaining construction partners uh, are jointly and severally liable, I've mentioned, in relation for the completion of the project, but also in relation to payments. Uh, they'll be liable for that. And as I said, most of the Almost all of the contracts that have been let, subcontracts, have been let by the consortium themselves rather than Carillion, uh, with the two exceptions I mentioned previously. Yeah, so so there, are, there are possibly two subcontractors that may end up um, out of pocket, I severely out of pocket because of the Carillion, because, because they, they were subcontracted directly to Carillion rather than to the, to the consortium as a whole. Is that correct? It, not quite. Well, it is correct, but I would say that at least one of them is actually a subsidiary of Carillion itself. Oh, it's right. uh, one of the, I think, the Labour Agency staff. It was actually a, a subsidiary of Carillion. Okay. Okay. Thank you. Okay. Um, Richard, I think you wanted to ask some questions. Uh, Good morning, Cabinet Secretary. Can you confirm, you've just said in your statement a lot about uh, Carillion uh, workers. So we've got three firms who are working on this. Two of them have now taken over. Are they taking on the Carillion workers? And because of that, will that not also, to my mind, not delay some opening? You know, I know you haven't got a crystal ball. The road will open when it opens. That's my view. That was always my view in the M74 and M8. Sure. I never chased you for a, a date on opening in regards to that area, a previous big contract in Scotland. So can you give me assurances? Is it, and you made it... A few seconds ago, you said some. Is it going to be all Carillion workers are going to transfer over to their two companies to finish off their part of the contract, or is it only some? I can acknowledge the 100 per cent track record the member has in predicting that these big projects would open when they opened. Uh, that's been true in every case so far. Um, uh, he's right to say I cannot give the guarantee about all members. I think uh, half so far of the 76 directly employed Carillion staff have been taken on by the two other contractors. Um, and I think the implication is that many of the others, there's about another 130, I think, of other staff as well, some of whom are agency staff, um, uh, 
I can't confirm at this stage that they have been taken on, and we have no power. The Scottish Government has no power to instruct the two remaining contractors to take them on. What we have said is we want to do, and this is part of the discussion which we're now having with them, if there's something we can do to mitigate the impact on any staff that might be affected by this, and we're interested, and also in terms of subcontractors. You'll be aware that we had the recent problem with the BP pipeline, so we said we set up a helpline to the effect that any companies experiencing a cash flow situation because of that, we'd be willing to talk to them about how we can help. So the same is true for the employees. I think we should know in fairly short order how many um, are being taken on in totality by the Carillion, um, of the Carillion staff. But just now we know about half, and I'm happy to be corrected by the officials that have got more up-to-date information, around half of the full-time employees so far. There's a strong expectation that far more than that will be taken on because the work still has to be done and the two remaining contractors want to get it done as quickly as possible. But I can't be more definitive just uh, now. That's good enough for me. Um, the next question I'd like to ask you, could the liquidation of Carillion uh, result in Scottish-based suppliers the AWPR project not being paid for goods or services provided, I think, in a, a comment that uh, Peter uh, made uh, a, a few minutes ago. If so, what is the, the Scottish Government doing to assist these companies and can we uh, help them in any way? Well, I've mentioned, first of all, the helpline. We've established one both uh, for the, uh, the companies that might be involved uh, and also for employees that might be involved. We've also um, asked um, the private sector, all the big business organisations, if they can let us know of any uh, companies uh, that might need some assistance or may be impacted by this, not just for the AWPR, but for the other contracts as well. And also, as I mentioned, had um, conversations with the trade unions, if they're aware of any other situations. We have a, a, a big interest in the apprenticeship programme, which Carillion had, many of whom we are responsible for helping to fund. Um, so. We've, we've taken that action. We've made it clear we stand uh, willing to help. Um, and the key thing is keeping people employed and getting this project done. They're not directly uh, a responsibility to take on, but we have made it clear we want to help, and we've given it public information to that effect. Good enough for me. Thank you. Secretary, just before we move on, could you just clarify something for me? The, the receivers who are dealing with the, the liquidation, do, does the Scottish Government have to deal with them re regarding the specific monies dealing, uh, owed to Carillion for work that's been completed as at today's date? Because I'm assuming that, that as at the date of liquidation, there would have been an assessment of all the works and the monies due to the, to the partnership at that date for that works completed. If you could clarify that and whether it's the Scottish Government speaking to the receivers or the receivers speaking to the other members of the partnership. I think both things are happening, but the receiver has been appointed by the UK government, so uh, Scottish government officials are not necessarily transport officials, but procurement and other officials. Uh, until recently, it may still be the case, we're in daily phone calls with representatives from the UK government and the receiver as well, and they are trying to manage that process. The receiver takes the decision, they've been appointed to do that, but we have been involved. I think it's worth saying that neither the UK government nor the Scottish government has got complete line of sight on all the work that Carillion was involved in, especially in the private sector. So it's being fed into by other parties. But we have a direct relationship with the receiver, but it's, it's um, in conjunction with the UK government. I don't know if that's the question you were asking. But well, the, the second question was just at, at the date that, that it was placed into liquidation. I'm assuming that, that you have an assessment of all the work that's been carried out so you can assess how much money is due on, on the bit that's been built to that date? No, there is no... Um, well, they don't receive payments for anything that's not complete, apart from, I mentioned, Crabston and Dice, which have been complete, so they receive money for that. But they don't receive money for any other works, uh, and, and maybe Michelle can give a more technical that, but they won't start to receive the unitary payment or a proportion of it until further works are complete. I think it's just important to clarify that the part of Carillion that uh, it forms part of the uh, ARL, the Special Purpose Vehicle uh, for AWPR, is not uh, insolvent. However, the part of Carillion that actually undertakes the construction work and is part of the construction joint venture for AWPR is insolvent. Any monies in terms of unitary charge for like, the Crabston and Dice section um, that the Scottish Government pays is paid to ARL, and ARL is the part, has the part of Carillion that's not insolvent. Um, so for, for the purposes of AWPR, it would be ARL that needs to be in touch with the official receiver. Okay, but I mean, there could be monies that are due to ARL that are owed by the Scottish Government, 
which equates to work that's already been undertaken by, by the parts of the ARL, which could, could include Carillion. So there could be money coming to Carillion and the receivers of Carillion uh, uh, as a result of works that are ongoing. That's correct. And the, the, okay. the Scottish Government is, uh, as Mr Brown said, the Scottish Government is in touch with the official receiver in any case. Okay. And, and we remain available should they get in touch. Thank you very much. Uh, Colin, yours is the next question. And good morning to the panel. Um, given the liquidation of Carillion and, and concerns over other companies such as Interserve and, and, and the recent breach of EU rules around NPD projects, do you think the time's right to review the operation of the, the NPD programme and the use of outsourcing companies? Uh, I'm not sure what breach of the rules is being referred to, to be honest. Uh, there was a recent rules around the funding of MPD products that, that require additional um, funding from the government uh, on a, a range of projects, right. obviously, some time ago. But given, given that issue and given the current challenges with Carillion and concerns over other companies such as Interserve, is it not time to, to, to look at that whole model again? And in particular, specifically, the use of outsourcing companies? Uh, well, there's not much um, that we've done in, in the Scottish Government in terms of outsourcing. I mean, the vast majority, especially of the service-based contracts, are those let by the UK Government. Uh, and in some cases, so the West of Scotland Housing Association, and there's a, a PFI project which Glasgow, um, Greater Glasgow Health Board signed, I think, in about the early, nine, maybe 1999-2000 period. So we haven't done much in terms of the... So, you know, Scottish water still in the public sector are prisons. We haven't gone for the privatisation of those prisons and many other aspects of what the UK government has done. Plus, Carillion and I think also Interserve are both involved quite heavily in defence um, stuff, which obviously wouldn't apply to the Scottish government. There wasn't a breach of the MPD rules. There was a reclassification by the EU. Um, ESA 10 was the instrument whereby they reclassified and issued further advice and that was the one which uh, resulted in the Aberdeen Western Peripheral Route coming back onto the public balance sheet. I think the one area that I would say that we do have to be um, very aware of is, and we are looking to reduce Transport Scotland in particular, but I think it's going to happen across government, although it's Derek McKay that's responsible for procurement, is in relation to some of these projects and them going to very large companies. If we can do more to try and make sure that more local companies, if you currently do very well in terms of the subcontracts uh, for these uh, uh, contracts, we are looking at how we can do more to try and make sure that local companies have greater access to some of these contracts in future. Uh, and of course, in general terms, we will always keep these projects under review. The member might be aware that the whole MPD um, a process is part of a review about how we finance these larger projects in any event. Thank, thank you, Mr. for that answer, in, in particular reference to the, the, the need to look again at some of the, the impact on smaller companies who tend to be at the very end of the chain uh, once these contracts are, are, are given to big companies like Carillion. But there's also shared concerns that we continue to use companies like Carillion whose, frankly, practices in terms of workers leave a lot to be desired. I mean, Carillion obviously have a long-standing issue around blacklisting, and, and just recently we, we've seen reports whereby workers uh, on the projects um, are having to pay up to £25 just to receive their wages because the company are using umbrella groups to employ these workers. Do we not need to look at some of the working practices um, that, that some of these companies have again when we're awarding contracts? Well, I think, first of all, both the terms of the awarding of contracts and employment law reserved to the UK government uh, have been for some time, and of course it was the decision of many of the parties represented here that should continue to be the case. So there was one public contract that we were involved in where a, com a company was, um, if you like, themselves blacklisted by the UK government. So we were then able, under law, to say, we will exclude you from consideration for this contract. They were then put back onto, uh, if you like, an approved list. So we had to, we, do have, we have no choice. If we exclude a company, um, then we can be, uh, and there's not the backing of, for example, the UK government or the EU having said, this is a company you shouldn't deal with because they've been blacklisting or so on then we can be subject to legal action for that. That wouldn't be responsible in terms of taxpayers' money. Uh, we have taken much stronger action in terms of blacklisting in Scotland uh, than elsewhere in the UK, even though we have quite substantial constraints in terms of our powers. And the member will know the EU regulations in terms of companies that have been involved in blacklisting and how they can um, uh, remedy that situation that's laid down by the EU. So we're not... We're not able to uh, take, I'd dearly like for us to be able to take that kind of action, but currently that action in terms of uh, excluding companies, procurement laws, and in terms of um, actions on blacklisting is reserved to the UK government. 
what obviously isn't reserved is a decision by the Scottish Government to actually outsource these big projects to, to, to these large companies. Can, can I move on, though, to um, another concern that, that we have, uh, and that's around um, the consortium who have the contract um, for the AWPR accepted responsibility recently for silt pollution in the, the Don and Dee rivers, um, and that resulted in a penalty of around £280,000. Now, given that concerns had previously been raised about this issue, uh, and you, Cabinet Secretary, gave specific assurances to this committee on the 14th of December 2016 that mitigation measures were being put in place, how did this pollution happen? First of all, just to your first point, I'm not sure what massive outsourcing, I really don't know what projects have been referred to, so it would be useful to have that so I can respond more accurately if that's required. In relation to the two incidents um, for salt pollution uh, at the dawn of the day, we, uh, the Scottish Government, take our environmental responsibilities very seriously. And following both of those incidents, we have continued to work closely with SEPA, which of course is a government agency, and the contractor to ensure the water courses on site are protected from construction activities. So following a period in June 2016 where there was extremely heavy rainfall, if you recall, uh, the contractor voluntarily suspended activity across the site for two weeks to put further mitigation measures in place. Now, it is an extremely unfortunate occurrence uh, and measures have been put in place to ensure no further recurrence. Uh, we welcome any measures that have been agreed by SEPA and the contractor where they result in a positive impact. I should say that the offer of enforcement undertaking is a matter for the contractor and SEPA, and we are unable to comment on that specifically. But, of course, we have enjoined the contractors to make sure that this kind of incident doesn't take place. One more question, then I'd like to move on to Jamie Green, if I may, please. In December 2016, Cabinet Secretary, you did say to the committee, as part of the Scottish Government's continuing scrutiny of, of the project, I've put in place detailed governance arrangements which are overseen at the top level by a project board involving Transport Scotland, Scottish Futures Trust, funding partners at Aberdeen City Council and Aberdeenshire Council. So what additional governance arrangements need to put, be put in place that weren't in place to prevent this particular pollution happening? Uh, well, of course, I've mentioned already the role of SEPA, so we've made sure that we work very closely with SEPA to make sure that uh, oversight role um, is... Uh, is overseen by them. They are the experts in relation to this. And of course, in addition to that, are the project management um, processes that are in place to oversee. So we have people on site uh, virtually all the time. It perhaps would be useful for Michelle Rennie to add to that, but uh, actually looking at what's been done on site in order that this kind of eventuality doesn't happen. But I don't know if you want to comment further. That's precisely the case. Uh, specific measures were taken after those events um, and indeed SEPA um, provided dedicated staff to work together full time with the contractor to both on their proposals for future works and on any mitigation for any, any events that had already occurred. I should also say, convener, that in relation to that incident, um, and again, I can't mention too much about the legal aspect of it, but uh, the offer of enforcement undertaking resulted in around £280,000 of environmental benefits for communities. It does not excuse what happened, and we should avoid it, but that was recompense made for the damage done uh, to some extent by the contractor. Thank you. Uh, Jamie Green, you've got a... Thank you, convener. Uh, good morning, Cabinet Secretary and the rest of the panel. Um, Following on from what Mr Smith asked, um, notwithstanding the Cabinet Secretary's comments that there are fewer uh, managed service contracts in the Scottish Government, uh, without being specific to any existing contract or contractor, can I ask what general uh, measures in terms of resilience or planning the Scottish Government is undertaking uh, outside of any normal due diligence that it takes prior to awarding a public contract? Uh, around the potential for any uh, other failures of these such organisations like Carillion. In other words, what uh, measures are going into ensuring that if this, if this was to occur with another contractor, the government uh, has adequately prepared for such events? I would say in the first instance that we uh, keep our ears pretty close to the ground. This is true across all sorts of uh, contracts certainly that I've been involved in. So any either uh, information coming to us from whatever source, either publicly or otherwise, uh, we will uh, take on board and investigate that where it's necessary. 
I think also in relation to the MPD projects in particular, there are obligations, very onerous obligations, on the contracting parties in terms of the, the stock exchange and financial reporting, where they have to be very explicit about the, the situation they're in. And so that there is ongoing um, uh, diligence, if you like, done uh, acting on any intelligence received. There are certain reporting obligations, both to um, the financial markets, but also to the Scottish Government from the parties involved as well, and perhaps the officials could say more about that. And that would be over and above the diligence what was, that was done, say, for example, when we had the first profits warning from, the first of three profit warnings from Carillion action was taken at that point, not just in relation to the AWPR. So we immediately get asked by the public and interested members what is the situation here. We make our own inquiries based on that and take action to mitigate any further risks. The biggest action, of course, as you've mentioned, is at the start of the contract, where we make sure there's a contingency if one of the contractors falls over in this way. But the officials might be able to talk more about the financial diligence than me. We uh, routinely undertake financial health checks on a variety of different companies. Um, at, the, at the points where we make decisions about uh, bidder selection and contract award, and now also throughout the contract delivery period. Um, in the event that we think that there's a, any particular risk, we'll look at what contingency measures are available. And they range you know, across a variety of different things. In the situation like AWPR, we have a, a joint venture situation where the other joint venture partners can, can come in and take up that, that uh, mantle. In other situations, we have frameworks or other, other procurement routes to uh, be able to deliver the same services that we would have got under the original contract. Is the uh, Cabinet Secretary or uh, uh, Ms Rennie aware of any other companies that um, the gov Scottish Government is uh, worried about or currently investigating into its financial status outside of Carillion? I think we, we continue we continue to review a range of companies. I don't think there's, I mean, in terms of the major projects, there's no specific risk to any major project at this point in time. Thank you. Subject, John. Uh, yes, change of subject, Prestwick Airport. Uh, you mentioned Cabinet Secretary in your opening remarks and gave us a few figures. I mean, the, the fact that turnover uh, and usage, I think, are, are increasing is positive, although I think that it might be reflected in other airports as well. Um, I think, if I caught you correctly, that you said the loss had been £7 million, which was an improvement. But, I mean, even if the loss reduced by a million a year, we'd still be making losses for quite some time. So can you give us a little bit more of a feel you know, is there any likelihood of this being passed over to the private sector in the short term? And, you know, do, is the government still optimistic that the loans that have been made, you know, will eventually be recovered? Um, on the point about uh, that we passed over to the private sector in the short term, I think we've always said that we're willing to listen, as we always have been, <coughs> to uh, interest from the private sector. But I don't see any immediate prospect of it transferring to the private sector. Uh, I think 7.8 was the exact amount of uh, the losses this year, down from 8.7 million before. Uh, and that is a lot of money, there's no doubt about that. Although it has to be set uh, as next to, if you like, what the cost of closure of uh, the airport would be in terms of the employment and the costs, social and financial, of that level of uh, unemployment. Uh, and one example that I mentioned, I think last time was at the committee about a company called Chevron at the airport um, who had taken one of the hangars for which obviously that produces a revenue stream or rental income for the airport. Well, that's been extremely successful such that they are now looking to take on further uh, accommodation there as well. I think we have said it was always uh, going to take uh, a long period of time. And part of that is because uh, members that are familiar with the airport will know that the previous owners, Infratil, had not invested substantially in the, the physical um, uh, built environment at Presswick for a long period of time. And we've been trying to catch up with that, obviously, to try and improve it. I would say I, I was down in Presswick Airport, I think, the week before last, and uh, I, I see substantial improvement physically. I mean, they've had things like the whole duty-free area has been refurbished, but the actual appearance of the airport um, is substantially better. And I think they are shifting focus to some of the other areas, freight, the military flights, which I mentioned, uh, and rental income from some of their other facilities. And they're doing that quite effectively, but it will take time to do that. So um, 
I, I, I can't say when that will turn a profit, and I can't also say when that will um, revert to the private sector. Both of those things are our intentions. And loans which have been made are made, they have to be made on the basis that they will be uh, returned uh, with interest paid. Well, th thank you for the answer. I, I mean, you, met, you specifically mentioned freight, and uh, I mean, the figures we were shown, 2007, I think, Prestwick handled more freight than Glasgow and Edinburgh combined. And now it has it handling, or by 2016, it was handling less freight than either Glasgow or Edinburgh. So although you say, I mean, closure would mean a loss of jobs in Ayrshire, but presumably could Glasgow and Edinburgh handle all the work that's been done at Prestwick and handle the freight and the passengers? Or is there other work at Prestwick that couldn't be handled by Glasgow and Edinburgh? Um, I, I don't think you would get uh, Glasgow or Edinburgh, and it's not for me to promote Glasgow or Edinburgh or Presswick um, over and above one or the other. I don't think you'd get Glasgow or Edinburgh to say that they have reached capacity in terms of freight or passengers. Uh, the one thing I'd say about the 2007 figure you mentioned, and quite rightly, but there was a, a period of decline for the airport, which most of us, I think, will be familiar with. And it's also true to say there's a, an inextricable link between passenger and freight, and as far as much of the freight going in and out of the UK goes in the holds of passenger uh, jets. And if you don't have that growth in passenger numbers, then you do affect your, 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 the level of freight that involves them. But despite that, we have seen an increase in Presswick. Uh, on the point I've made, though, about the general improvements at Presswick, I, I would make the offer, convener, to the committee that if they wish to go and have a, a tour mm -hmm. of the facilities, it might be useful to see that, because it's, mm -hmm. it's just me saying it just now, but if you go down and experience it for yourself, especially if you've been familiar with the decline of the airport over previous years, you'll get a, a feel for that, and uh, Roy Brannan would be happy to arrange that for, uh, for the committee. But, yes, I think John Mason is right. There's been a decline in freight from 2007. Of course, we didn't have control of the airport, but what we have seen more recently is an increase in freight. Oh, just one more. Okay. Uh, sorry, John. Okay, well, I, I certainly would take you up on that offer, and I would like to visit Presswick a while since I was there. Uh, but my final point uh, would be, so overall, are you satisfied that we are making the progress that the government was hoping would make, albeit gradually? Uh, well, we, yeah, we were very explicit about this would be a, a long-term thing. And, of course, you want to see more progress being made. Um, but I am confident, especially, I think, with the management team that's there now, that they're actively looking at realistic opportunities to increase the revenue and reduce, uh, if you like, the losses that have been made and turn that into a profit. Uh, Richard. Yeah. What discussions are we having with other air airlines in the Gartley Press? I was in Presswick, picking up my daughter and grand grandchildren one night, and I was the only, the only person there at 11 o'clock at night, waiting on the flight coming in. Very few flights coming in. If you look at the graph, um, the basic passenger numbers have fell from 2.5 million to under uh, uh, 500,000, uh, based on what I'm looking at, maybe slightly up. But, you know, we've got other airports, I'm getting emails every month, Glasgow, fantastic, Edinburgh, fantastic. Oh, let's build an extra runway down in London. For those who go to London, you travel 20, 30 minutes, 40 minutes out in a train, cost you a fortune. I have to say to you, since we upgraded the M74, the new extension, now the old extension, um, you, know, you can get to Presswick in about 20 minutes, half an hour from where I stay, because it's, it's excellent roadways. Why are we not promoting Presswick. I think it's a jewel in the crown that we need to promote because there is plenty of slots, plenty of space. What's the problem? Yeah, I think, well, first of all, we are promoting Presswick um, and the responsibility for trying to attract additional passengers lies with the airport. They have to be distinct from the Scottish Government and I know the activity that they're undertaking trying to do that. But just to go back to the point that uh, Richard Lyle makes, going from his home to Presswick Airport, he will pass Glasgow Airport. And we no, have I to... no, I don't. No, I don't. No, I don't. I'm not sure about the route no, that you take, but in any event, sorry, yeah. sorry. Can I just can I just yeah. stop that there? Let, let's not have a discussion on on routes and how we get to it. Can we maybe just uh, build on Richard's question and ask how to promote passenger numbers there, cabinet secretary? Yeah. Well, I think that, that you've, you've quite rightly identified the, the biggest challenge that they have, but there is a huge amount of work going on. And some of the offers they've made to try and attract more business in, perhaps Roy Brannan could talk more about that because actually Roy is on the holding company which 
also runs the airport despite being Chief Executive of Transport Scotland, so it might be useful to hear from Roy. Yeah, I mean, I think the, the first thing to say, I think you're, you're right, uh, Mr Lyle, that this, it's got a huge potential there. It's 2.1 million people within 60 minutes of the airport. Uh, a third of people that travel there just now travel by train. It's got its own air bridge direct to the rail line, and it's very good connections to the M77. All of that is factored in to the executive team's uh, promotion and marketing of the airport. They work tirelessly as, a, as an executive team to try and attract additional services into the airport. But the, the, the market in peer-type peer airports across the UK is very similar pattern. So all, all kind of passenger numbers declined from 2007. So the heady days of 2.5 million are, are some time away now. I, I think what I would say is I'd refer you back to the accounts that were published just before Christmas, uh, and there is a short increase in passenger numbers over the last year. So it's, it's heading in the right direction. But uh, the strategic plan that was set up last year, 2017 to 2022, they've got a real strong focus now on, on business growth across all revenues. So Presswick isn't about just passenger numbers, it's about a kind of mixed bag of operations. And I think that's why it'd be really important for the committee to come down and see it for first hand and see exactly the extent of the land holding, the facilities there, the operations that are done in terms of uh, fixed deployment services, military aircraft coming in, refuelling. There's, there's a huge potential for Presswick to become a real driver for economic growth in that part of the country. And that's what certainly my role as the non-exec director on HOCO board and also chief executive of Transport Scotland, working with Andrew Miller and his team is all about trying to make this a success story. I'm going to bring Jamie in uh, at this stage, please. Thank you, Governor. Uh, uh, Mr. Brannan's comments uh, segue nicely into my question. According to my briefing papers that the former uh, CEO, Ron Smith, uh, departed at the end of October 2017, uh, and it is said here he left by mutual agreement. Um, call me cynical, perhaps, but I think few relationships end so amicably. Can I ask whose decision was it that Mr. Smith departed? Uh, what reasons were given for his departure? And how has that impacted the management team's ability to deliver on the strategic plan? I think uh, well, Roy would be much closer to this than I am. We don't have responsibility for those kind of appointments. Well, not for his appointment, but I don't know if you want to comment on Roy. Yeah, just picking up the cab site's comment. That's a, a matter for the OPSCO board. It's an arm's length company. They run it at arm's length from us. Uh, he left by mutual agreement. And Stuart Adams is now in, who's got over 40 years worth of experience as a chief executive across the aviation industry. And, and Andrew and his team felt that that was the, the right thing to do to take a, a different direction. He was only there for 17 months. Uh, I, I, have the OPSCO uh, given either Transport Scotland or the Scottish Government any uh, reasons for such a prompt departure? Though? No, other than that uh, Ron is instrumental in developing the corporate plan, the strategic plan, 2017 to 2022. Uh, but Stuart is now in to try and look again at what more can be done across all the different avenues. And as I say, it's a, it's a question for the OPSCO board rather than the whole co board of Scottish Government. Uh, so uh, do they have they indicated when a new permanent CEO may be appointed uh, in terms of timelines? And also, does this represent perhaps a shift in direction for the strategic plan in terms of turning around uh, the airport or indeed uh, presenting it back to the private sector? Again, it's, an, it's a, an issue for the OPSCO board and Andrew Miller as the chairman in particular when he appoints his executive team. Uh, the team are working across all six strands of the strategic plan and I'm sure Stuart will be putting his endeavour into all of those six strands. I appreciate much of the answer that I've just received is, refers me to the OPSCO uh, however, we don't have the benefit of having them here, given that this is entirely funded by the public purse and has ultimate responsibility lines up uh, through Transport Scotland and the Scottish Government. I would be hoping that uh, the members of the panel would have uh, some more oversight into what's happening at Press Week rather than just refer me to the OPSCO. I don't find that particularly helpful, I'm afraid. I think you find we're obliged to do it in that way. That was the basis on which we were allowed to invest in um, a, a Presswick Airport when we did. There are certain obligations on us, but I would say that um, the visit that's been referred to might help answer some of the questions that Jamie Green has about the direction of the... You'll be meeting if you have the chance to go with the executive team and others and have the chance to put those questions directly to them. Happy to take them up on that offer. 
just on that visit, uh, we'll, we'll get a chance to discuss that as a committee after that. Can I just to pick you, follow on from, from what's been said? We've heard about the increase in the facilities at Presswick Airport and the investment there. In fact, I was looking back at the accounts, just looked through an old set of accounts, 2016, uh, we, we, uh, Scottish Government invested 26.8 million into it. Uh, 2017, we'd increased the investment to 37.9 million, rough 11 million pound uh, increase, costing us 745,000 pounds to service. But the value of the assets in the 1st of April 2015 was the same value as the assets on the 31st of March 2017. That was two years later. Um, that strikes me as odd. Could you explain to me why there has been no, no increase in the value of the assets uh, despite a massive increase in funding, Cabinet Secretary? Well, uh, no, I can't. Uh, that's information that would be held by the OPSCO, but it may be that I, I can certainly speak to the experience I've had of going there and seeing the difference in the facilities, like, for example, the frontage of the airport. I've mentioned the duty-free areas, and I think they've also been recently relatively recent an upgrade in terms of the security as well, but um, I, I don't know if you want to comment further on that, Roy. I, I, I don't have an answer to that, but I certainly can uh, endeavour to get an answer to that and provide that to the committee in due course. Okay, I mean, it, it seems odd to me, uh, if you're signing off a set of accounts, that the, the opening value is the same as the closing value when you've invested a further 11 million in the project. I mean, I, I, I don't understand that. So that would be grateful for you to clarify that to me. And the other question, was one, a lot of the profits that have been made have been done on fuel conversion. Uh, in fact, the, the fuel uh, trading uh, figures there have gone up uh, by uh, over 100%. Um, is, that, is that a fragile way of increasing the uh, turnover of an airport, seeing that the price of fuel, as we know, and the price of oil does go up and down? Yeah, I, I don't think it's so much the the volatility of the price which determines the opportunities there is the willingness of carriers to use you for that purpose. I think that's the big, they're going to have to get fuel from somewhere. Um, there, is, there is actually some interesting um, issues around the, the, the issue of price as well and where you can source it from. And uh, again, I, I, it's probably best answered by the OPSCO, but they've been involved in some pretty robust discussions with the suppliers to try and improve their margins in relation to that. Um, I know that the committee has previously had um, uh, representatives from uh, Presswick, and they're probably better placed to answer some of these specific questions. But I don't know if, if Roy wants to say any more about the fuel situation. Yeah, in terms of fuel, it's... Context, uh, freight, av other aviation, property, car parking, concessions and passenger numbers are all about flatlined. The only, the only increase in uh, revenue in 16-17 uh, was due to freight. So it, it, it does obviously play a pretty important part. So, Roy, I'd, I'd like to hear that. Yeah, the, in terms of fuel, the, the, the biggest increase is obviously the, the additionality that's come from military planes flying into Presswick to refuel fixed-based operations, so private jets and, and other uh, aircraft that's coming in. Uh, they have to go somewhere to fuel if they're going across the Atlantic, and Presswick has been very successful in attracting that additionality uh, to the airport. So that's seen a huge increase, and they hope to grow that, as they will do on all the other streams, whether it's car parking, revenue from passengers, uh, the operations of the, the property itself. Once Chevron continue on with their maintenance, repair, and overhaul, we anticipate they'll see, see more work coming through that facility. So, as I said at the start, it's not just about passengers, it's about actually growth in a huge range of activity. And I think when you come down, hopefully Andrew and the team will be able to communicate exactly what their, their okay. plans are. And, and maybe I could just part the final question and say, when, when I come down, I, which I, I very much look forward to taking up on that offer, uh, I would love to see the investment property because it seems to be declining in value every year. Peter, sorry, you want to... And it just it falls on from exactly what you've been saying about growing the business, and uh, you know one of one of our great success stories, uh, export success, is Scottish food and drink, and the biggest food export is, is Scottish salmon, and we export thousands of tons of salmon every year to America, and that salmon, as I understand it, is all trunked down to Heathrow Airport and flown to America from Heathrow, or four or five hundred miles further south and than where we are at Prestwick. I see a huge opportunity for uh, Prestwick Airport to grab some of that uh, freight business. Um, 
I've already written to Keith Brown on the subject, and I would just, you know, I wonder how actively you were looking at that, because I think there's real, the real opportunities there. Uh, as Peter Chapman says, we've discussed it previously, and I think I mentioned that time, we have looked at this previously ourselves as well. There's a huge increase in, for example, fish farm salmon in, in Scotland, and there's large international demand for it. And as the member says, some of this is transported down to Heathrow, which can't make sense in terms of the environment. Uh, however, much of it uh, is transported, as I mentioned earlier on, in the belly of passenger jets to the Middle East. And the economics of that are something that you have to overcome. It's also true to say that the way that it's done uh, just now, uh, it's because it goes to certain points where there's distribution centres. So if it goes to the US, it goes to one point, but there's a huge distribution network that follows on from that. Nevertheless, um, uh, as, as I say, I've investigated this before. After we had the discussion, I spoke to the management of Presswick Airport when I was down there recently. And to try and move things on a bit, I've asked them to convene a meeting with suppliers and others. Now, many of them, and you'll know this better than me, are pretty fixed on the way they currently haul their product. If you remember all the, the huge problems at the Channel Tunnel, we again at that point said Presswick was there, other airports were there, and the economics of it didn't stack up. Plus, the suppliers wanted to use the haulage networks that they had, notwithstanding the problems they had at the Channel Tunnel. So just to assure the member, this has been actively looked at, and I've asked them to convene some of the producers to make sure we can properly investigate any opportunities that might be there. Okay. Thank you. On to the next question, uh, John Finney. Thank you. Before asking it, it's been remiss of me, um, uh, convener, not to declare my membership of the RMT parliamentary group, so sorry I didn't pick that sorry, up. Sorry, thank you. Um, uh, morning, panel. <clears throat> Cabinet Secretary, I'd like to ask you about high-speed rail, please. And uh, There was a, a report uh, commissioned in 2016, and I understand that there's joint working between the the Scotland and the UK to progress that. Um, are you able to provide a, a, an update on the development of plans to extend high-speed rail services in Scotland since the publication of that report? And do you have a view for those who are critics of that level of investment, even enthusiasts for rail in that particular level of investment on a single scheme? Uh, well, we, we, of course, are not responsible for uh, the investment. The UK government is responsible for that. And as the member says, there's been a recent reported substantial increase uh, in the high-level costs of the current proposals for HS1, uh, sorry, HS2. Um, our, our position is that um, Scotland should benefit from this, and it shouldn't just be in terms of whatever benefits happen south of the border that might feed through to, say, reduced journey times north of the border. There's two aspects. That one is reduced journey times. We think that will improve the attractiveness of uh, rail travel, especially vis-à-vis -vis, uh, air travel. So journey times are important for that purpose. But probably more important is the capacity issues on both the West Coast and East Coast mainline. So that's why we think there has to be investment. There was a commitment made by the UK then Transport Secretary to have journey times in Scotland reduced to three hours. It was made at his party conference. We noted that, we've investigated that, and we know that it's not possible to have those kind of journey times without investment actually in high-speed rail in Scotland. Not the same, perhaps, as a fully high-speed rail um, line all the way to Edinburgh, Glasgow, but there has to be high-speed elements to it. So we've used that to have a discussion, uh, some joint investigations with the UK government as to what the feasibility of that will be. Uh, those discussions are ongoing. <coughs> It is true that we will get some benefit, of course we will, from improvements from London, London to the Midlands, uh, but we want to have improvements to the um, network here in Scotland as well. So that's the current basis. I don't know if uh, Roy wants to add a bit more to that. Yeah, so we have the North of High Speed 2 working group, which is comprised of DFT, HS2, Transport Scotland and Network Rail. And we, we've narrowed it down to, there's two options, uh, on the East Coast and the West Coast. And the First Minister made an announcement just before Christmas that we would take forward a more detailed feasibility study now to look at the, the feasibility of those two options. So on the East Coast, we're looking at a new high-speed line between Dunbar and Newcastle, which would potentially reduce the journey time to an hour on that section, uh, which would bring those two cities, the Northern Powerhouse, much closer together to Edinburgh. Uh, and then, in equal terms, make it Edinburgh, Scotland to Glasgow, to London, sorry, three years, 25 minutes. And on the West Coast, a cord which basically touches Rutherglen, Castairs, and then down to uh, the border. And again, improving at a high-speed rail link, it provide that opportunity to get down to about three and a bit hours to London on the West Coast. So tenders are back just now. We will uh, hopefully award 
a contract for that feasibility study, and I would be happy enough for the team to report back to the REC later on in the year on the outcome of that. Part of five, this is, in layman's terms, a completely new line or an upgrading of the existing, because there is concern that the existing facilities uh, infrastructure will could lose out due to the approach taken in respect of high speed. So, so if you take the East Coast, that this, this is a new high speed line. Uh, now, I might get this wrong in terms of speed, but it could be 250 mile, up to 250 mile an hour line speed off the existing line. If you know the existing line already, it's very close to the coast. It's been moved already. It's probably going to need moved in, in you know, two, three decades. So this is a new high speed line separate from the existing line, which would provide the opportunity to run both high speed trains, but also uh, the local service enhancements that, uh, that we'd be looking for. Okay, thank you. I, I wonder, a, a question to um, the Cabinet Secretary, and that is about the carbon assessment of infrastructure. Um, my colleague uh, Patrick Harvey uh, raised issues at the Finance and Constitution Committee, and they, they received a, a letter back from your, your colleague, um, the Cabinet Secretary, uh, Mr Mackay. Uh, and, and it is positive news. There is, there is uh, the percentage of the Scottish Government infrastructure spend that's uh, low carbon is moving from 21% to 29%. So consequently uh, uh, high carbon down from 23 to 12%. And that excludes local government um, expenditure over which the, the government has no control. How can you maintain that trajectory, particularly with the road building programme you have planned? Uh, well, I think uh, the road building programme is, in our view, um, there have been, and actually as confirmed by a previous UK transport secretary, there have been completely insufficient in, uh, investment in Scotland's transport infrastructure for a period of decades, and that related um, to the roads as much as anywhere else. Uh, so, yes, we have had a, a large um, road improvement project over uh, a number of years now, but we think that's necessary. It's also necessary, of course, for low-carbon vehicles, buses, and even bikes to use roads as well. So we've, we felt that was absolutely necessary. But that has been matched by our investment in rail, whether it's improvements to services, new rolling stock, new stations, new lines in relation to the borders rail as well. But I do think uh, we've said... From some time ago, our ambition was to have all of Scotland's cities connected by at least dual carriageway, if not motorway. And that does mark a point uh, once we've completed the um, A9 and A96 when that will have been achieved. And I think even in anticipation of that, some of the big projects we've had, the M80, the M8 bundle that Dick Lyle talks about, uh, the Queensferry crossing, I think we are seeing that shift moving towards... Uh, some of the things which the First Minister has talked about in the programme for government towards low carbon. So I think you'll see that increase over current years. But we did think it was essential to make those investments in the road network uh, to make up for what had been decades of underinvestment. I think you'll see that shift increase over coming years. Cabinet Secretary, there's going to be um, the same time lapse with regard to uh, out with that triangle, because a lot of the, the road infrastructure that's not in there hasn't been maintained or upgraded. Is there not going to be a further? If, if well, uh, six billion in two roads. Uh, as you've mentioned, uh, the vast majority, I think 96% of the roads in Scotland are under the control of local authorities. And it is for them to take um, uh, action on their roads, although there are some areas in Inverness, which you'll be aware of at Longman Roundabout, where we are working with a local authority, where you've got a conjunction of local roads and trunk roads, proposals in Ayrshire for a similar kind of scheme as well. But these roads are the responsibility of local authorities, and you wouldn't want us to be telling local authorities how to do their business. I don't want you to be spending 70 million quid in a roundabout just to get people five minutes quicker off a bridge. I think uh, the, the public don't get that the infrastructure where they are, they don't get the differentiation between um, government trunk road responsibility and local authority responsibility. Infrastructure's crumbling out with that triangle. Mm. Yeah, nevertheless, whatever the public's perception is, is a legal um, definition of a roads authority. We are not the roads authority for those roads. We can't go in and start working on those roads. We're not able to do that. And in relation to Longman, of course, we responded to requests from local partners, including local authorities, as to the projects they wanted to prioritise. I'm equally critical of them, but thank you very much indeed. Leave that one there, if I may, John, and move on. The next question, the Deputy Convener, Gail Ross. Thank you, Convener. Good morning, panel. Um, Cabinet Secretary, you uh, mentioned quite well, more than mentioned, went over um, in some detail the dueling of the A9 and A96, and um, John Finney's just touched on it there as well. So I won't linger on it, but um, if we start off with the A9 dueling project, 
Um, it says in our briefing papers that uh, preferred routes for 36 miles of the 80 miles have been identified, but you said in your opening statement that 90 per cent have been identified, so I think that's quite considerably more than uh, we've been um, told about. I'd like to just ask about the 10 per cent, because obviously if you travel the road, you know that there are some quite difficult bits to get a, a dual carriageway in. Um, when do you envisage 100% of preferred options being identified? Yeah, I think um, uh, for that uh, late, later on this year, but perhaps is it Michelle that would know uh, about the background? It's £200 million of new projects being procured at present um, from a, a, a Lunkerty in particular. But do you want to come back on that, Michelle? Yeah, or is it, I think is it going? Going? Sorry, Alan. Yeah, yeah, as you say, there's, there's over 90% of the, the the A9 dual lane has now preferred option status. Uh, the one section that doesn't is between Burnham and Dunkeld, okay. which we're currently working with the, the local community in a co-creative process, um, and we hope to identify a preferred option for that one um, later this year. Okay, that one of the options being proposed, you may have seen on social media, is by, it's, it's a very unusual process. First time we've ever done it called a co-creative process being undertaken with local authorities, and the Children's Parliament's come up with a suggestion of a an egg-shaped roundabout which has a guinea pig farm in the centre of it. So we're looking at all, all possibilities and all suggestions. Sounds fantastic. Um, I, I should just say that that particular section, and, and the members are quite right to say, why, why is that one uh, the one that's an outlier, if you like? Well, if you think about the, the Dunkeld uh, railway station, if you think about the local roads and the constraints on that, that is one reason why whatever you do there is going to be contentious, and that's why we've taken a bit more time uh, on it. Okay, thanks for that. Um, so, the, to, for both dueling projects, then, the A9 and the A96, um, how do you engage with communities along the route to make sure that, obviously, um, it's a minimum disruption and that you're doing what is best for, for those communities? Now, if I can try first of all, I think that's one reason, not the only reason, that we've done it in a phased way, so the 12 phases of the A9. If we try to go out to a public consultation on the entire length of it, people, as you would know better than me, uh, could be just swamped by all that, the, the, a large part of the road that they might not be familiar with. Uh, so it is in manageable chunks, and that allows us to undertake uh, pretty substantial consultations. So recently I met with a local group, um, uh, the Menachie group, in, in the, on the A96, um, and it does allow them to be very focused on the particular part that's of most interest to them. So we do that, and of course that goes right the way through the consultation process, public exhibitions, right into local interest groups, um, community councils and local authorities, right the way through to, if necessary, a public local inquiry. So there's a huge amount of engagement involved in these projects. Okay. Um, as you said, well, as um, John Finney mentioned, it's, it's three billion pound per project. Um, A9 due to be completed in 2025 and A96 in 2030. I know it's very early, but at this point in time, are you on schedule and on budget where you would want to be? Yeah, I, 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 Cabinet Secretary, I don't think that's a spring or autumn question. I think it's quite, uh, quite a general one. It's a one. general one, indeed. <laughs> well, I, I do think, and I have said before, and would say again, that at this stage of the project, all we could do is give an indicative figure. The three billion um, pounds is obviously, if on the A9 you've got 12 different phases, you haven't, you're going to the market 12 times. So we had to give an indicative figure. We've done that, but we have been um, uh, specific about 2025, and that is. Uh, our intention and there's nothing that's changed in our intention or in relation to the A96, um, the year 2030. And actually some people said when we first announced that about how far away it seemed. If you look at the processes you have to go through in terms of PLIs and so on as well, that is actually quite a tight timescale and it always was. We said that from the very start, but there's nothing uh, as things stand um, to come to change your mind on those target dates. There are a lot of questions in this section, so uh, um, I'd just like to push through them as quickly as possible to make sure we get everyone in. John Finney, would you like to go first, please? Uh, thank you, Convener. Uh, Cabinet Secretary, um, yeah, a question about consultation, and though not supportive of either of these projects, I I'm very supportive of the co-creative process that's in place in the Dunkeld area, and I think that's a very constructive way to go forward, particularly the engagement of young people, because in the timescales we're talking about, of course, that they are going to be the they're going to be the people who are going to be using these facilities. Um, can I ask in relation to, to, to consultation, would you envisage using that co-creative process for the A96 
and on a specific issue that I've raised with you previously, I think here, if not in, in writing, um, if that consultation suggested that rather than a grade separated junction, a roundabout, which is significant savings in that, were a preferred option, is that something that would be taken on board? Uh, I, I certainly would be taken on board. Um, I think the thing with the co-creative process, I mentioned it's the first time we've done it, and we're not keen that um, if we have a co-creative process which takes substantially longer than uh, a standard process, that that jeopardises the long-term targets. We'll get criticised for that, I'm sure. So we do have an eye on trying to make sure we proceed with the project. And I think there's also true to say we're trying to learn from having done this the first time. But yes, if there was a demand, uh, in, and there's been talk of this with uh, another member not currently present, about whether that could be used for one or two of the more contentious parts of the N86, whether that could be transplanted, we are willing to look at that. And if that results in um, a suggestion for a roundabout, a grade-separated junction, of course we'll look at that. I would say that a roundabout, and I'm conscious I'm sitting beside transplanted, transport exports, a roundabout does introduce a level of disruption to uh, a journey which um, a grade separated junction seeks to alleviate, so there's a pro and con on both sides. But we would take forward any or look at any suggestions that are made as part of that process. Thank you. That's very reassuring. Thank you. Thank you. Uh, <coughs> Fruits, McGregor. Thanks, Convener. Um, I was going to ask questions about the M873, M74, and I think it's testament to Transport Scotland and the Scottish Government that were um, talking about this towards the end of the meeting. Um, and that is indicative that, that, that there has been uh, very little issues um, after the completion. And I can <coughs> also testify, within one of the areas that it goes through, that it is uh, bringing benefit. But I suppose my concern going forward is how do we ensure that the, the benefits that were expected are realised, and particularly the areas that it runs through, uh, a lot of these areas, including my own constituency, uh, are very deprived areas. How, how do they benefit from that? Have you got any thoughts on that, Cabinet Secretary? Uh, I think, to be fair, there have been uh, issues subsequent to their completion. I'm sure, as Mr Lyle would uh, testify. Um, uh, but I think, uh, I think the member is exactly right. These are hugely beneficial to the area. If, and you will know better than me at the Wraith Interchange, for example, the transformation that's uh, been affected for people using that. Uh, there was a report done by, um, uh, this was mentioned by the First Minister, um, or in fact somebody from the Chambers of Commerce at the opening by Will Hutton, or a comment made by Will Hutton some time ago about the extent to which the uh, proper transport links, and this is rail as well as road, between Edinburgh and Glasgow and points in between, if they could be made as efficient as possible, then that could become a real powerhouse, mainly to do with labour mobility and so on as well. So that's where I think some of the huge benefits will come from, from the roads uh, being improved. It's a, it is a bundle of roads. Uh, again, we were questioned when we did that to put these different, uh, sometimes disparate works together, but then you can get um, uh, more, um, uh, more for your money if you do that. Um, it was a difficult project because, unlike some of the other projects we've discussed, it was all online. The Aberdeen Western Peripheral Route is almost entirely in its, own, um, uh, in its own space, whereas this was online, one of the busiest roads in Scotland. Uh, it does mean, of course, uh, Main Street Scotland, if that's how you want to refer to the motor route in Edinburgh, Glasgow, is now a motorway the whole way. So I think those are where the, the reduction in journey times, um, the reduction in environmental damage, because traffic jams are one of the worst things for... Um, producing um, uh, fumes and so on, uh, and also the ease with the relative ease with which you can move goods and people around the country are where the benefits will come uh, from that area. And of course, during its construction, there were substantial benefits from the employment that it produced directly as well. So, as I suppose, following on from that, and, and to clarify my, my original point in, in terms of constituents that have came to me with feedback, they're talking about um, better journey times. Uh, and less congestion, uh, as you mentioned. But I suppose what, uh, you know, it's, a, it's a longer term um, concern that I have because obviously it's just up, it's just running and every, everybody's behind it. But what I wouldn't like it to become in the future is almost a bypass for some of these towns that, that are there, you know, a sort of Coatbridge, Airdrie, Bells Hill bypass. Um, I'm sure that's not the intention of uh, the government. And, I'm just wondering if you can look at ways that we can, can avoid that, that happening so that every part of the network gets equal uh, advantages in, in improving the communities. It might be useful to hear from uh, some of the experts that we do try and take that into account before we commit to some of these major projects. But you're right, it is a dilemma that you face. The classic would be Route 66 in the States where they've got the efficient 
uh, road service, but many communities suffered as a result of that. However, I'm aware of, uh, from a time as Transport Minister, any number of communities demanding bypasses, they want to have a bypass. Sometimes afterwards, the consequences of bypassing can be quite substantial for local communities. But we do try to take that into account through the assessment that we do. I don't know if somebody else wants to come in on that. Yeah, yeah, yeah. As, as the, an engineer on top of, in charge of uh, Transport Scotland, I'll try and answer that. But we do, uh, we do look beyond traditional transport economic modelling now. So we look at the wider economic benefits of all our transport schemes. Uh, and traditionally, in the past, it would be about engine efficiency, journey time savings, accident savings. But now we will look much further than that. And uh, again, a, a useful example is Borders Railway, where you, the, the blueprint for Borders Railway brought those benefits much wider than just the linear transport link between the borders and, and, uh, and Edinburgh. So uh, the points we all made, I think when we did the opening at Maxim, uh, Maxim, the, the chap that was in charge of Maxim at the time, it started to suggest that there would be an increase in kind of business activity towards that location because of the fact that the strategic network had, had been unblocked. So, so we're catering for strategic traffic, but we're also very mindful of kind of business growth in the, the local area as well. Richard. Yes. Um, before the AWPR, this was one of the massive biggest projects in Scotland and in my area and many members in this committee were fed up with me continually asking questions about it but can I say that in the time that they dealt with uh, both, both Mr Brannan and Michelle Rennie and yourself cabinet secretary responded diligently to all the questions letters and complaints that I had and my constituents had and I personally thank the three of you for that and I know cabinet secretary you mainly were instrumental in getting all the traffic cones removed that, that, that were sitting on the M74 after the, 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 the day that it opened. Um, but basically, and you're right, there was sometimes you went down to, you know, the race interchange and you were going one way one day and the next day you were going the other way. And it was very confusing for a lot of car drivers, but, you know, and, and it was, we had to remember people were working and people were using that and, what you've done was absolutely fantastic. So I'll compliment you. Here's the bad bit. Shawhead flyover. Between my colleague and, and my constituency, there's still a site of building materials, uh, fences, you, that's been there for the last six months. I see Michelle nodding her head. Um, when's that going to be removed? There still is a factor of, and with the greatest respect to my colleague, there ain't no signs for Bell Sill on the way out of the M8 coming out for Glasgow Fort. The three gantries that you've put up, you could put a sign that says Bell Sill Cope Bridge. And also when you come to the Burgedi Roundabout, you could put a sign that says Bell Sill. There are more signs for McKinnon Mills than what there are for Bell Sill. So I want Bell Sill back on the map coming out for the M8. And uh, uh, you've, you've asked me about that. Uh, you've, you've already know about this. But basically, as I say, I want to compliment you on the work that's done, how the thing, the journey times have improved, fantastic roads. And the question, I think, has to be asked, what lessons have you learned from, and I, I think in the com comments that I had, discussions I had with Transport Scotland, and I'll cut this down, is that, uh, based on the contract, there wasn't a leeway to vary the contract any, based on that contract as it was set, particularly, and I'll raise the factor of uh, um, tree felling, tree reinstatement. And I think there are still some areas that need to be, uh, currently Roy Brannan and Michelle were out the uh, uh, area, still looking at noise, re uh, noise reduction. And there's still some areas that need to be tidied up so what's, uh, and I'll finish at that, convener. Heap of points that you've raised there, many of which are consti constituency issues, which I'd be very happy uh, for Michelle or the Cabinet Secretary to respond to you or to the committee in writing so that you can actually have those answers relating to the signs and, and uh, the storage uh, parts and the tree felling. But I think there was a general overarching point, Cabinet Secretary, about lessons learned. Do, 
Do you want to pick up on that very briefly, if I may ask you to do that, please? Yeah, I think uh, uh, Richard Lowell makes a very good point. And I think uh, after each of these projects, and go back to a point made previously by Colin Smith, how do we, how do we learn from this? I think there's a tension between um, cost, between um, delivery dates, uh, between the nature of the contract, how tight it is, and you've made the point about how we can make sure the traffic management is, is done the best way possible and the consultation happens about it and uh, giving flexibility to the contractor. And these are real tensions, and different awarding authorities take different approaches. So we do look at that, and I think you're right to say that in relation to that project, which I think was a fantastic project, which has resulted in long-term benefits uh, to the roads network, especially in relation to uh, diversions and traffic management, I think we have some lessons to learn from that. Thank you. Uh, I'm going to move on to Mike Rumbles next, and then Jamie Green. Convener. Um, Yesterday on the A90, uh, the government made some uh, welcome announcement about 99% um, of drivers now obeying the speed limit because of the um, average speed cameras between Aberdeen and Dundee. And that's welcome news. I think everybody would like to see that. And also everybody wants to see a reduction in the number of road accidents. Is there an assumption being made that because drivers are now staying within the speed limit, there is a reduction in accidents for those three months, October, November, December. It would just have been helpful if, as well as, ha as, well as connecting, uh, to make the connection between the two, as well as that information about drivers obeying the speed limit, whether we could have um, the statistics about whether there's been a reduction in accidents between October and December uh, last year on that stretch of Trunk Road. It's a perfectly fair question. It's, it's actually uh, more to do with um, uh, Hamza Youssef because it's not a major project. But I think uh, from my experience on the A9, there was a time lag <laughs> between the figures that you mentioned in terms of speeding um, and in terms of accidents. Uh, I don't think, other than the fact of when the information becomes available, there's any issue with that, although it's, they're issued by the police, I think, rather than us, is my recollection. But I'm happy to ask my colleague to see if that, that information can be provided. That would be very helpful. Thank you. Well, the clerks will contact you just to confirm that that information will be requested by the committee. Um, Jamie Green. Thank you, Vino. And apologies to the Cabinet Secretary if this is a matter for the Transport Secretary. Um, but I'll pose the question uh, with the benefit of the panel that we have. Um, the briefing notes I have say that the project for the M8, M73 and M74 was completed in the spring of 2017. Uh, does the Cabinet Secretary have any views, uh, however, on the fact that the overhead gantries are not in full use at present, that the information matrix boards are not fully operational, there are no speed or safety cameras in operation, and indeed none of this has any uh, mains power, it's all been run off of diesel generators. Could the Cabinet Secretary or anyone in the panel outline a timetable for when this uh, motorway network will fully be operational, including all of its safety features? I think it is one for me rather than for, for Amza Youssef, and we can get the detailed response uh, from the officials on that. But what I would say is, and this applied also to um, the Queen's Ferry Crossing, is if we were to wait until every part of the project was finished before opening the road, I think we'd come under substantial pressure, from, and I know it's happened, from uh, members of this committee, other members in the public, to say, why not open the road and do those things as you can do them? So... Uh, it's always the case, this, this is not snagging work, I think your point is about work that would always have to be done in terms of the gantries and so on, but we do try to get the road open as soon as possible for a public benefit and we do anticipate some work will take place after that, but I don't know if, would it be yourself, Michelle? I think the, the first thing to be very clear about is that before we open the roads, the roads are deemed safe for operational use by an independent road safety auditor. So. Um, there is no, there's no risk to the road user uh, of using the roads at all. Um, in addition to that, uh, as Mr. Brown said, there is, uh, there are always works that are not necessary for the safe operation of, of the road, but um, would be preferable um, to have complete at the earliest opportunity. So with that in mind, the contract is set up in such a way that there's, uh, there's a milestone, if you like, for opening the, use, the road for full usage. And then there's another milestone after that, which is final completion. 
with those milestones, there's, a, there's an associated uh, payment. So until such time as the road is, all, all aspects of the road are fully complete, the contractor doesn't receive full payment. So he is fully incentivised to complete that as quickly as possible. The programme for uh, completing uh, any of these jobs is, is a matter for the contractor. It is his programme and it's up to him to manage and resource that programme. The contractor for the M8 currently estimates that um, uh, around April he should be complete um, and it, it's then up to him to make sure that that happens but he won't be receiving the full payments until such time as he has. So just to clarify, the current uh, presumed date of, is April 2018 for uh, the aforementioned uh, additional features of the motorway system to be completed. That's what the contractor is projecting, yes. Thank you. Thank you. Uh, and just to remind the committee at the outset, the Cabinet Secretary mentioned the Queen's Ferry crossing, and so if there are any questions that any of the uh, committee have on the Queen's Ferry crossing, uh, now is the appropriate time. Maybe I could just ask a small one, Cabinet Secretary, just to clarify, the budget for the Queen's Ferry crossing, that just... I, I've struggled to find this out. Maybe just a quick answer from you will, 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 will clarify. That covers all the costs to the existing road ne network from one side of the crossing to the existing road network on the other side of the crossing. That's what the budget covers. And uh, that it's, there's been no other work put in any other budget, is there? It, no, in fact, it's the reverse. It also covers substantial works on either side to the existing yes, road. Yes, I'm saying well. right the way across to the existing yeah. road and where it forks off the existing road and joins the, the road again on the other side. All that is covered in the, in, in the budget price that you've given us. Yes, and there was, I think, three distinct elements to it. So I think the underlying question is, are we salting some part of the budget away to some other budget? Not that I'm aware of, no. I, I um, wasn't suggesting that. I was, just I was just trying to ascertain, because there was quite a lot of works... In, in the lead up to, to and, and the lead off from the new road. And I just wanted to make sure that was all in the budget. Yeah, I think we were clear there were three distinct elements to it and we priced each of those and they've come down, of course, over the time. But I, uh, I don't know whether it's Michelle or, or Roy that's best place to answer that. All, all the works associated with the project are included within the budget that we've been reporting to this committee. Thank you. Does anyone else have any questions? Uh, Mike. Yeah, just a quick question, really. Great that the road is now open. When will the whole of the works be complete? Not just a snagging, but, you know, I don't necessarily want to ask the cabinet, but the officials, when will the whole work be completed? When do you think it will be completed? We've, uh, I think we've, we've, uh, the committee has received a letter from us outlining the programme of works between now and uh, next September, and we expect that all the works that we currently know about will be complete by then. By September. Cabinet Secretary, could I just ask, we received as a committee a letter saying that the responsibility for the Queen's Ferry Crossing now passed to Hamza Youssef, and, and, and you've mentioned it at some length this morning. It would be helpful for clarification for future meetings if we know who we are to direct our questions to, should there be any questions to uh, post this meeting. So just a letter to confirm that to the committee would be very useful. Okay, just, say, just now it's, it's relatively straightforward. The major projects, including the Queen's Ferry Crossing, are my responsibility. The project is, has is coming to the end, as you can tell. So I'm still answerable for that part of the project. As to the day-to-day -day running, um, then it's, it's some of use of responsible for that. But I'll write and give a, a written clarification if that would, okay. if that would it, suit me. It, it's just at odds to the letter that we received, but it'd be useful to have clarification. Thank you. Uh, Richard, it uh, looks like you've got Well, I'm sure somebody question. will come up with this question. Any more snagging needing to be done? Any more road closures needing to be done? Or is it now all fully opened and running well? I think that's pretty much laid out in the letter, but I don't know if you want to add anything uh, yeah, to it, Yeah, it's Michelle. just as laid out in the letter. Thank you. Thank you. I think that's all the questions we had. Cabinet Secretary, I'd like to thank you for your attendance this morning. I'm Michelle and Alistair and Roy, and I'm now briefly going to pause the meeting to allow the witnesses to leave.
I'll bring you back to order, if I may, and we'll move on to agenda item three, which is subordinate legislation. It's the consideration of two negative instruments concerning the management of fishings. There have been no motions to annul received in relation to the instruments. Is the committee agreed that it does not wish to make any recommendation in relation to this, these instruments? That is agreed. The committee now will move into private session.